Thank you. Got the light. Hey, Jake. Jake, can you get the lights behind you? Thank you. All right. Who who is who is uh, who's crafty can build things. Yeah, a cabinet. Scott. Okay, I want uh, Scott. Scott and Ralph, y'all see me after. I want to cage. I want to cage him in. Okay, where's he? He see he didn't, he's not here, so we won't tell him. Where did he run to? Um. All right. Uh. Children's ministry. See me right afterwards. Men, we're going to have a uh, men's breakfast pretty soon, so be looking out for that. Also. Does everybody, did, has it been communicated that I wanted to have a leadership and a call to hidden in a small groups meeting Sunday evening? Has that not been communicated? It's been on the board? Thank you. Okay. Um, That's uh, Saturday. It's Sunday evening. Um, crap. Okay. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to have a meeting Sunday. Uh, if you can make it, please make it. Okay. All right, at between 5 and 6.30. It's from 5 to 6.30. Thank you. You ready? All right. <laughs> You're so funny. From 5 to 5.30, small group leader, right? Okay, or anyone who wants to do small groups from 5 to 5.30. From 5.30 to 6, it will be leadership. And then from 6 to 6.30, it will be called and hidden. Okay? Shower Saturday. Anna is out of ICU. She's in a room. Praise God for those of you who have been praying for her. Um, and there was something else I was supposed to announce. Oh, Destiny Discovery starts Sunday. If you have not already registered, please do so. Um, if you're having issues registering, you can see me after church. I'll be back over here in the coffee area with my other laptop. And I will either get your issue resolved or show you what you're doing wrong. <laughs> Probably show you what you're doing wrong. Hallelujah. So if you haven't registered, please do so. We've got lots of new classes coming, so we really don't have extra books. So we need to make sure that we got them enough printed for you, so please register. Um, again, if you want to know what ones there are, you can see me over there. Where? <laughs> Where's over there? In the coffee bar area, you guys. Okay. Amen. I'm sitting. Forgive me. I may jump up in a minute. Y'all pray for me. I'm not feeling well. I'm feeling on my way to feeling better. But I don't want to fall down like he does. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm the smart one. I sit when I need to. Amen? Hallelujah. Anyways, we're still talking about holiness. Everybody say amen. Holiness, a subject that we love to hate. Um, but I'm almost about to preach the same message I did last week. And because we're going to recap it, hallelujah. Keith set me free the other day. He encouraged me because the Lord kept, I mean, we've gone very slow with this Fully Alive series, haven't we? Some of y'all already to be done, and but we're not. We're going to take our time because we use repetition in every form of learning except in the church. That's so good. Let's just say law. Think about that for just a moment. How many of you remember the four point, the three points we talked about last week? I love you, but. We all knew his message was sold out last week, but not everybody could say what the point, his four points about being sold out were. We all remember being unashamed because that was the scripture from the Romans, but we couldn't remember all of them off the top of our head. And that's not to chastise you. That's just to let you know that you do not retain the information. You retain about 20% of what you're being told. <sighs> Amen. I, yeah, you're looking at your notes, cheater cheater. No. Um, yeah, I mean, you're, you, that's why we take notes, so that we can go back and look at it. But sometimes we move so past, we, 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 move, we move so past past something. We move so fast past something. Lord have mercy. Sorry. Hello, hello, hello. 
So I'm going to recall f some of these points again because that's what I feel like I need to do, and then we'll expound on some others, okay? You all right with that? If you're not, tough. <laughs> so the first thing, <laughs> let's pray. How about that first? Amen. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, we just thank you. We thank you that you are the agent, hallelujah, of holiness inside of us. That because you are alive and well inside of us and that you ignite that resurrection power that, that you are in yourself, that we get to walk in a resurrected kind of a life. And that resurrected life enables us to be holy just as our Father is holy. What a pleasure it is to be able to walk with you as your friend, to cooperate with you and to labor with you as you work in us the perfect will and the do of our Father's heart. We want to embrace the call to holiness. We want to move past just talking about it, but actually begin to exhibit a lifestyle of being consecrated and set apart so that we can manifest the very presence and glory of our Father. We want to turn the world upside down, and we do that as we live a life that's holy and set apart. So, Holy Spirit, we just invite you again just to come and work inside of our hearts tonight, to expound on the areas that you want to expound upon, to bring revelation to the very areas of our hearts as individuals that need it. We just submit ourselves to your rule and reign in us tonight and say that whatever you want to do in this place today, we agree with it. We won't be offended by it, but we will work with you. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So when it comes to living holy, to living like holy stones, because we are a stonework that is being attached to a cornerstone that is holy. So in order for us to be a building that's being built up like he wants us to be, we, all, we also must be stones that are holy. We have to look like him to be built up into his body. And let me just uh, say something in regards to like when we prayed tonight for each other. If I can encourage you to let you know that your gift and your word and your touch is so crucial because we are a body. Now, if you, if you slam your thumb with a hammer, I can use Ricky as an illustrated sermon. If you give me the hammer, I'll slam his thumb for you and show you what he does. <laughs> but he would probably shout, run. He may immediately do this. some kind of action to protect his thumb, right? He may even pull it close to him. Who knows? Whenever you're in pain, your whole body reacts to pain, right? Every time you're in pain, your mouth, hallelujah, <laughs> your mouth may get you in trouble, but your mouth does not mend your pain. You don't look at your pain and just say, oh, you don't hurt. You don't hurt. If your finger is bleeding and you're if your finger's crushed, you're like, no, I flip it hurt. Hallelujah, it hurts. No, you begin to medicate yourself, and you use your other hand, other parts of your body to bring healing to that place that's hurt. That, that is what the body ministry is. See, if you only come to me for prayer, all you're wanting is the mouth. See, you're the one that needs to cover the thumb, to lift the foot up when it's, it's stubbed its toe. You're the one who wraps the, the knee that's bent at a joint. Whatever it is, see, that is why it, I know it's uncomfortable for, for many of you to pray for one another, but it's necessary. You, the healing for the body comes from the body. It doesn't just come from one place. That's, that's, that's revelation right there. That's why you can't say, oh, God doesn't want to use me. No, if you're attached to the body, he plans on using you. His, he's fully intending on using you. You're important, and you're needed. And I can't touch everybody, and he can't touch everybody, and you as an individual can't touch everybody, but we as a people can touch everybody. Amen? So that's why it's very important that you understand that you're very valuable, and the people around you need you. So anyways, the first thing I want us to recall about being holy is that the law of the Spirit is actually more difficult. However, we've been given the power to work it out. Amen? 
Jesus said, oh, it's not just you doing the act of adultery that makes you an adulterer. You think about it in your brain, ta-da, you're an adulterer. That's not very encouraging news, is it? <laughs> the law of grace, the law of the Spirit is actually a little more difficult. He said that when you think a thing in your heart, you are it. So if that's the case, then really technically the law of the Spirit is more difficult when we look at it just from that, that lens of hard or easy. But when we realize that because of the law of the Spirit, we've received also the Spirit of grace, and grace is the enabling power to work out whatever it is that God has told you that you can do or what you should not do. Amen. Grace is not him going, <laughs> I didn't see that sin. <laughs> no, that's not grace. Grace is Here's the power for you to do the very thing that you think you cannot do. So you may think, there's no way I can live the kind of life. I may be able to restrain my organs in my pants. However, I can't stop my brain from thinking about sex. But God says, by the Spirit of God, you can actually have a mind that's so clean that you won't even think about it either. Hallelujah. That's powerful. That's the Spirit. That, that is the God that we serve. So it doesn't matter what your issue. It's really easy to talk about money and sex, hallelujah, because we all, and food, praise God, those three things. But that, it, that works for everything. God gives us, in this law of the Spirit that seems to be more difficult, the grace to be able to do everything he's calling us to do. So the very paradox is, th is this, that because we have greater restraints now in the Spirit, we're actually more free. That's the paradox of living a life in the Spirit. We have more restraints, but we are more free. That's a glorious truth. I am more restrained today than I've ever been in my entire life, and I am freer than I've ever been. And so what we look at, we look at restraints as something that are ugly and we don't want. They're handcuffs to us because they're keeping us from being free. And it's actually the very opposite. The restraints keep us more free. You know, I love to do puzzles. And I used to do, like, real puzzles with pieces everywhere, and that's so messy. I was kind of OCD about it. I like to do them, but I don't like the mess. But, you know, with my iPad, I can do puzzles. It's lovely. So, anyways, I do. And when you do a puzzle, what do you do first? You always do the boundary first, right? You fit everything in the boundary. You make the boundary first, and everything goes It's the same way in the spirit. The boundary's first. He puts the boundary first. Life in the Spirit is according to the Word of God. It's the boundary. And he builds your life from the boundary in. That's a good word right there. Okay. So the second thing we want to recall is this. That first of all, sanctification or holiness is based solely on the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. And it was brought forth to us from the Father. So basically, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So being holy and sanctified and consecrated, first of all, it comes from the Father. It was on the Father's heart for you to be set apart and consecrated to him because he loves you, not because he wants you to have a miserable, no fun life. He is not the fun-sucking God, okay? He, he's the fulfillment of all pleasure. He literally says that. At my right hand are pleasures forevermore, and what's at his right hand? But Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of pleasure forevermore. Oh, that's just, where's that? I love it. So, the Father wanted it, and Jesus was the action. He said, I want, I want a people sanctified and holy to me. So, he, he gave us Jesus so that Jesus could die so that you and I could be set apart for him. That's a a glorious truth. And the second thing is that it is by the Spirit that the holiness that he's called us to is accomplished in us. So we see the Trinity at work in the work of holiness. The Father desired it, the Son paid for it, and the Holy Spirit works it into us. Amen? That's good, right? Did you all remember all that from last week? Oh, not a whole bunch of amens going on. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. The third thing we want to remember from last week is that if sanctification is a work of the Holy Spirit, and we saw the scriptures last week that shows that it did. I'm not going through all that again. Y'all can watch online. So the Spirit of God is the living water, right? We all agree? He said from your belly is going to flow what? Rivers of living water, which we know is the Holy Spirit, which we know is zoe. It is the life force of God. 
So if the Holy Spirit is that alive in us, then that means the work of holiness is something that's constantly being bubbled up and active inside of us. Holiness just doesn't just happen one time because you said yes to Jesus. Holiness is alive and active and always bubbling up inside of us. So holiness is a continual perpetual work because the Holy Spirit is the perpetual spirit. And so this is important for you and I to really comprehend because we, we, we choose so much to think that, well, if you're saved, then you should be acting perfect. You're just nothing but a hypocrite. Amen. Can I give you a real deep revelation? Every person in this room is a hypocrite. Hallelujah. I had a lady call it. I had a lady called the church one time, and she's like, I just need counseling. But them people that I go to church with, they're nothing but hypocrites. And I told her, I said, well, before you go any further, I need to let you know, I'm a hypocrite. But you're the pastor. Yeah, I'm probably the biggest hypocrite of all. <laughs> Pretty much what that boils down to. <laughs> she didn't take my counsel. But that's okay. Hey, it is what it is. The whole thing is we are all in the work of sanctification. We are sanctified, but we're being sanctified. We're saved, and we're being saved. Amen? So the work of sanctification is an ongoing work. Now, this should set us free in some areas. I'm not talking about downright rebellion when you're snubbing your nose at God, but in the process of trying to walk this walk and rid yourself of the things that you know the Holy Spirit is trying to rid you of, that work is a process, and sometimes it's gradual, and sometimes, praise God, it's slow. <laughs> sometimes the work of holiness is slow because we, we are not the smartest people. I'm sorry. I am not the smartest person. You are holy and <laughs> perfect and all related to Jesus very closely. However, those of us rednecks on the outside live out in the country that no one wants to talk about. We're in the process. I know, really. <laughs> Mine too, brother. Mine too. I don't like to admit it, but they're all from Mississippi. God help us. Okay. Since the nature of the spirit that's chosen to take up residence inside of us is alive and perpetual, we must realize that sanctification and holiness is also alive in us and perpetual. This is why we don't get to stay the same way. It's why we walk continually pursuing the nature of the new man and not the old man. It's a walk. Now, this is very important. I don't think I mentioned this last week. But to the degree in which we respond to the Spirit within us is the degree in which we will experience greater and greater freedom from our soul's nature. To the degree which you and I respond to the Spirit of God that's in us, we've got to respond to what the Spirit is speaking to us as individuals. Now, here's a really good revelation nugget for you. This is like a big, big old piece of gold that's coming down from the sky right now to smack you in the head, okay? What God is dealing with you on is not what God is dealing with everybody else on. Let's all just calmly pause and think about that just for a moment. Also, the thing in which you have already been set free from and walking all holy in right now, it took you forever to get and we endured your butt the entire process. So would you please stop making everybody else around you endure your righteous, holy self, which is acting unrighteous and unholy when you try to project on somebody else something that you've already obtained by much process. Oh, that's so good. Did you feel that? Did you feel free right there? Hallelujah. I'm the, I was the world's worst. Once I got it, well, y'all were idiots. Why didn't you get it? That was pretty much my thought process with everything. I got it. You're dumb. <laughs> Until my holy husband, I actually call him Righteous Ricky when he irritates me. I'm like, whatever, Righteous Ricky. Which made me antichrist a net. That's another that's another message. <laughs> Not going there. 
But he would tell me, just because you got it doesn't mean that everybody else, how come you give yourself grace in the process, but you give nobody else grace for the process? Amen? You know, when we don't give grace in the process, all we find is ourselves in offense and judgment. Amen. My ears got hot. That must have been the Holy Ghost. Oh, you see how red they are? Woohoo! Okay. Fourth thing. It's either that or the fever, or one or the other. I don't know. I'm just going to say it's the Holy Ghost. Okay. <laughs> so the fourth thing we need to recall is that living a holy life is something uh, that, because it is something that's developing in us. First of all, in the developing process, it takes one, cooperation. And by cooperation, we mean faith and obedience. We'll get to more of that in a second. The second thing it takes is prayer, and that's communion with the Spirit and communion with, the, with truth. Now, of course, he is the Spirit of truth, so you can't commune with the Spirit and not commune with truth unless you're listening to the wrong Spirit. But we want, if you're listening to the Holy Spirit, truth should be coming out <laughs> with it. The third thing is you have to persevere. You've got to understand that in this process that God is taking you through, when it comes to consecration and holiness to his will, you need to give your gra- yourself grace and patience while you practice righteousness and holiness. We talked last week a lot about practice. You practice sports, and everybody gets that. You practice music, and everybody gets that. You practice writing, and everybody gets that. Well, don't you remember? Well, now they don't teach cursive, which is just ridiculous. I'm like, if, if, there's, if, if I die... I have journals upon journals of incredible revelation. Not because I'm anything special, but because the Holy Ghost talked to me. And I have some funny stories in those journals also. But my, who's going to read them if they can't read cursive? They'd be like, Whoa. like Kyle Ripley, because I don't know. Like, you know what I mean? I'm like, we can't teach our kids to write cursive. It's ridiculous. But anyways, when I was in school, would they, would they make you write sentences over and over again? You're just like, eh, I don't want to write sentences anymore. And you were cramping all up. You know, I probably have carpal tunnel because of that very thing, writing constantly. And you had the big nubs on your fingers right there because you wrote so much. You had the big bumps. And, you know, you knew who was really doing the work because they had bigger bumps on their fingers. You know what I mean? I'm like, and we would write and write. Some, some of the kids are like, I don't know what you're talking about. Writing? What? We type everything. Yeah, we wrote. I had a typewriter that wasn't electric. Oh, it was in a case, and you came in, you can't, yeah, it was amazing, and you had to change the ribbon on it. And it was, and you, I, I know. I remember when we got the electric typewriter. I was like, ah, this is awesome. Okay. <laughs> Seriously. I was a, on the manual. I was me. I could beat all y'all. I'm telling you. I was a speed typer. I won awards for it. But anyways. Not to toot my own horn. <laughs> toot toot. Um, <laughs> however, we practice. We practice everything except we don't take the mentality of practicing into the church. We don't take the thought process of practicing living for God and, and practicing doing the works of, of Jesus and practicing in prayer and practicing in study. And we don't, we, and practicing in teaching. You know, uh, the church we went to Sunday. Yeah, a, a lovely, please pray for them. It's a lovely church. They're coming up under our wing, and, you know, we're thrilled about it. And it's just, you know, it's, it's awesome. And they've got good people there. And I was talking with uh, Becky, um, and she said, well, how do you, how do you know when to teach? How do, you know how, to, how do you know how to preach? How do you know how to do that? She's like, how do you know your style? How do you know what to, what to I'm like, you just practice. You just practice. I got to this after 15 years of practice, and I'm still practicing. Some of y'all are guinea pigs. Y'all don't even even know it. You know what I mean? It's like I'm just trying to figure this out as I go, amen? And when I go through different seasons, it changes because my heart has gotten increased with God and and these different things. And so you just practice. Nobody knows. You're scared to do something in ministry because you've never done it before. Well, of course you've never done it before. you got to practice. And we give you grace while you're practicing. If y'all could hear the, some of the tapes of some of my first messages, y'all would die. Yes, you would. Shut your face, Billy. He's so different than he used to be. I mean, although one of, his, one of his first messages, he brought in a big five-gallon bucket of cow manure. I will say that. That was the nastiest service I've ever had in my life. He was teaching. Remember that? You remember that? It was awesome. Though. I never forgot it, though. So What? 
you're still sleeping through service. That's your issue. Anyways, we're giving you grace. Hallelujah. Grace, grace. In your process. Get over it now. Okay. Um, <laughs> Literally, I said things that were completely unscriptural. <gasps> yeah. I preached stuff that went in the Bible. What was that? I sure did. <laughs> I did. I preached stuff that wasn't in the Bible. Do you know that godliness is next, or cleanliness is next to godliness is not in the word of God? What? Just so you know. I get so irritated with that. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. You're preaching that kind of stuff. It's not, it's not in the Bible. <laughs> you heard someone else say it. You're like, ooh, that's good vomit. I'll do it again. So that's basically what that was. I was regurgitating other people's messages because I didn't want to practice studying. But you know what? You practice. So you have to cooperate. You have to be in prayer and communion with the Holy Spirit, and you've got to persevere. This is going to take time. I, you know, God's outside of time, right? <laughs> That's why he's not in a hurry, and he's never late, because he's outside of time. And when you stop relying on time, you find his presence, and all of a sudden, you're fine. Because all, the, all, all of the burden of time is off of you when you finally get in Christ. It's an amazing thing. So you have all the time in the world. Yes, you do. So, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, in the Amplified. We're going to recap a couple of these scriptures. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. In him I have shared his crucifixion. It is no longer I who live, but Christ, the Messiah, who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the body, I live by what? Faith in the Son of God. So every action that we take by living a set-apart life in Christ, all of it must be done by faith. That's the first thing we talked about, what? Cooperation. You have to cooperate with the Spirit of God to walk holy. Remember, the purpose for this message right now is because God said we were going to be a holy people that's going to infect this city for Jesus. And if we're going to infect this city with Jesus and turn it upside down, like they did in the book of Acts, then we have to live holy. But that doesn't mean we're all going to be perfect and we're all not going to wear the same clothes. Hallelujah. It means that we're going to do what the Word says. And the first thing is we're going to live by faith. That the life that we now live, we live by faith in the Son of God. Amen? And why is that important? Romans 14, verse 23, uh, the last part there says, For whatever does not originate and proceed from faith is sin. Whatever is done without a conviction of its approval by God is sinful. This is huge huge. This begins to take us down a journey that says, huh, what is sin for one is not necessarily sin for somebody else because it's all about faith. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, the things, that you, I'm not talking about the things, the lust of the flesh and the fruit of the, 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 fruit of the flesh that uh, we're, we learn about in Galatians and even in Romans, but what I'm talking about is it may be faith for one person or okay for one person and sin for another person. And it's because God's expecting that one person to live by faith in that one particular area. And it's not about whether it's sin, like sexual sin or anything. Okay, let, here's a uh, watching, tele, not having cable. Perfect, perfect. Now, some people God have spoke to and said, you should not. Are you okay? Oh, I'm sorry. He says, he spoke to some people and said, you know what? Turn off your cable. You don't need to sow seed in that. You need to save your money, and you need to not entertain yourself and not have, you can't watch Netflix, stuff like that. No entertainment, stuff like that whatsoever. And you heard God speak to you, and so by faith, you go do it. But somebody else, just because they have cable doesn't mean that they're in sin. And then we try to project to everybody else, oh, you need to not have your cable. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. But no, it's sin to you because God spoke to you. He didn't speak to me. Hallelujah. That's a wonderful revelation right there. Some people think sports is a sin. People think dancing is a sin. People think instruments and music are sin. <laughs> Amen. Y'all y'all get it? So whatever does not originate in faith is sin. So faith emerges when we are called upon by the Spirit of God or Spirit of truth to take an action that's foreign to us. When God speaks to you and says, I want you to do such and such, and you go, Phew, that can't be God. <laughs> For the record, nine times out of ten, nine and a half times out of ten, it's going to be God. 
Because why? It's foreign to you. Because your immediate thought process is, oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. Fear rises up. I can't do that. Well, usually, <laughs> that's what faith is, right? Doing something that you can't do or thought you couldn't see yourself doing, and you do it anyways, right? That's faith, pretty much in a nutshell. That you trust God enough to do what you're scared to do, what seems foreign to you to do. So in the case of the cable television, you hear God say that, and everything inside you goes, that can't be God. But then you go, you respond in faith, and what do you do? You cut off your cable. Now, by faith and obedience, you've entered in to faith. That's a good word right there. See, Moses extending the rod over the sea was faith. Because when God said, I'm going to part the waters when you extend your rod, okay, yeah. Everything inside of Moses thought, oh, God, please let this work. I'm sure. I'm like, I don't think Moses was like, God is going to. I thought he was, he was probably thinking, I hope this is you. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't see him being like, you know, I'm just saying, now y'all may disagree, may just think, you know, when I'm just blaspheming because I'm touching Moses, but you know what I mean? I'm serious. I'm like, you know what I mean? I've never been like, woo, yeah, that's Jesus right there. No, every time I was like, ha ha, I hope this is you. I hope this is you so bad because if it's not, I'm in big trouble. I'm going to look like an idiot. And nine times out of ten, if your thought process is if I do that and you're not here, I look like an idiot, it's probably God. Because he doesn't really care if you look like an idiot. He's trying to get that out of you. Amen? So, you know, I mean, hey, Gideon went to war with 300 men. 300 guys against an army so big they couldn't count them. Doesn't make sense. And the only weapons he had was a, a trumpet and some empty vessels. Not even a sword. What is that? <laughs> exactly. I'm going to break this pot. You know what I mean? That's what they did. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's a big teacher right there, but I'm not going to give it to you right now. But that's faith. It looked impossible. He probably thought, this can't possibly be you. I mean, look, we know that he had those doubts because, first of all, when, <laughs> when the angel of the Lord comes to him and talks to him, he's talking to him, and he's like, you know, I think his statement was a faith, and we'll get into that some other time. But he says, he's like, look, he goes, hey, um, I'm going to get you an offering. Will you wait right here? <laughs> he's probably thinking, if this is the angel of the Lord, he's going to wait. You know what I mean? I wonder if he went and got his stuff and came back and was expecting him not to be there and thinking that he was just way too too hungry <laughs> and had been threshing way too long. You know what I mean? So he gets there, the angel of the Lord's there, and he, it comes up, the, the fire comes up from the rock, amazing, consumes it, and then when God speaks to him, he says, I want you to go down and I want you to tear down all the altars of Baal that your father has built up. And Gideon, Gideon's butt puckered. You know how you know that? Because God said, and if you're afraid, you can go at night. For the record, Gideon went at night. Hence, he was afraid. <laughs> Faith. David running at a giant with only a slingshot. Mm, Faith. Peter stepping out of a boat on the water. Faith. Don't you think Peter was like, oh. I mean, so everything God's telling you to do is not going to make sense. It's going to seem foreign to you. When, he's, when you're w in Walmart and he's like, that person has cancer, go pray for them. That's foreign to you. And you're going to keep doing it and keep doing it until what? Until you're practicing hearing and obeying. Oh, you labor with him. and You do it by faith. So we cannot live holy without having a change ultimately in our actions. And obeying the Lord in our actions is the outward sign of faith and love inside of us. And those outward actions are what's holy. It's making our hearts set apart for him. That regardless of what we look like, regardless of what we think we can do, what we can't do, we do it. And that's being set apart for God. You're just being a willing vessel. You're doing it afraid. You're doing it nervous. You're doing it sweaty. You're just doing it. We try to make it always so later on, when we're ready, we'll do it. And beloved, the earth is now in a great 
debauchery, and it needs us now. It doesn't need us to wait until we're ready. It needs us now. All we need to do is lead with our ear and start listening to what God is telling us as individuals. And what he's speaking to us is going to affect us in our heart, and it's going to affect our own individual lives, and then it's going to begin to affect the lives of other people around us. And the whole thing is, is even in the process of God's told you to disconnect your cable and you haven't done it yet, but you're willing and you're like, God, I'm scared to do this because, you know, I really like this particular program or whatever it is you're wrestling with. And he knows that's in your heart to love him and to obey him. And while you're in process, he can still use you. He can still use you. Your requirements to being used are, first of all, being submitted to Jesus and to his house. The first two things. And the other thing is just to be willing. Even in process, give yourself some grace in the process. Don't keep yourself in a place of rebellion. Don't misunderstand what I'm telling you. However, if you know if your heart is saying, God, I don't want this above you. I do want to love you. I do want to do everything you want me to do. I'm just struggling with this very thing. He's going to still use you. You don't have to wait until you're perfect. If we did, all of us will always sit right here doing nothing singing four songs, crying some tears and going home, waiting for the day that God's going to change the earth. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1 in the Amplified. It says, if then you have been raised with Christ to a new life, the sharing of resurrection from the dead, aim at and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, and set your minds and keep them set. Set your mind and keep them set. Where? On the things that are above, the higher things, the heavenly things, not on the things that are on the earth. See, your body is on the earth, but your, your heart is in the heavenlies. You are seated now in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So you and I reside on the earth, and we're not supposed to be concentrated on what we feel about on this earth. Our minds are to be set on the higher things about who we are in Christ and what Jesus can do through us and with us with the Spirit of God living inside of us. That's how we're supposed to live our lives. We have the Spirit of resurrection inside of us. There's nothing that this world can keep us down with at all. We, he's, he's defeated every enemy there ever will be. But if you look at your natural state, if you look at your natural condition, you will always feel defeated. If you don't set your mind and keep them set on the things that are above, as soon as look, Peter walking on the water, looking at Jesus, fine. He gets his eyes off Jesus. He begins to fall. Look, we've heard the message 10,000 times, but we don't apply it to our lives. Holiness is directly connected to your mind being renewed. It's directly connected to your gaze. What you look at, you become. What you behold, you become. So whatever you're staring at, I can guarantee you, you're going to start thinking about. And you begin to transform yourself into the very image that you're staring at. So if you continue to look at yourself, there's going to be more self coming out of you. But if you continue to look at Jesus, you'll have more Jesus coming out of you, looking into him. So verse 3 says, for as far as, as far as the world's concerned, you've died. Your new self, your new life, your real life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in the splendor of his glory. Jacket. Just a second. Yeah. So, first of all, Longhorns, <sighs> roll tide. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I found his suit, by the way, his, his, his outfit, Clayton. I'll never forget to give it to you. I bought him Longhorn stuff, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, you're, you have died. You and I have died. Our old self is now dead, right? And the new us, where is it at? It's hidden. In Christ, in God. This actually is the very thing that Jesus prayed in John chapter 17. That I would be in them and that they would be in me. And then we would be in you. 
and then we would be one. That was his prayer to the Father, wasn't it? He said that we would be in him, and that then once we're in him, that he would be in the Father. And so because he's in the Father and we're in him, we'd all be like those little Russian little thingies, what they call with the things inside, the, the dolls inside the dolls. You know what I mean? That's pretty. God the Father, the big doll. Jesus, what's that called? What are they called? Nesting? No. Mariska, yeah. Yet. <laughs> Mariska, yes. Us and Jesus, Jesus and the Father, and because of that, we're all in the Father together. Your life is hidden in Christ, in God. In Jesus, in the Father. In the anointed, in the anointed one, in the Father. In the anointed word, in the Father. Your real self is hidden in Christ, in the Father. Now, Jesus is the anointed word, right? This is, this is what Jesus prayed for. He said, I'm going to die so that we could all be together. And so he says, once you and I relinquish our rights to our own self-will and we take on the nature of God, that we are now just like Christ. And we've been born again. And, in, and because of that nature, we are now one with the Father. There's no separation anymore. Praise God for the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Now, he said, you don't know how to live the new life because you've never lived it before. So you got to practice it. And you got to learn about it, right, because it's hidden. The word is crypto. It's cryptic. It's concealed. It's a secret. Your real life is a secret. See, you don't really know who you are yet. It's a secret. But if you will get into Christ, in God, you will find who you really are. And the point of the whole thing is Jesus is saying your life is hidden in the word. And the word is in the Father's heart. And if you will get in the word, when you're reading this, when you're reading the story of Gideon in Judges chapter 6, you're not seeing Gideon, you're seeing you. It's your real life. When you're looking at Peter walking on the water, it's not Peter. It's the real you. It's hidden in that word. Because Jesus is the word. You are hidden in Christ. What we want is to not, he, look, part of the entire relationship that we have with Jesus is the pursuit. He is more concerned about the pursuit. He already knows that you have found him and that he has found you. But he loves the pursuit. He loves the back and forth. He loves all this stuff that he does with us. He loves you running after him. He loves it. He likes running ahead and you going, Whoa, and following after him and then not being able to find him. And where'd he go? Where'd he go? And you have to look for him some more. He loves it. He loves the pursuit. And the pursuit shows you who you are. Your real life is hidden in Christ. No matter what you're called to do or who you're called to be, it's in Christ. So how do you act in Christ? Go find out. How do you feel about things? It's hidden in Christ. It's a secret to you right now because he hasn't revealed it to you because you can only get that by the spirit of revelation. But if you will seek after God, he will show you who you really are. What you really think about things is hidden in Christ. You used to think abortion was okay, and now you know it's not okay because you found your hidden self in Christ and realized life mattered. You were pro-choice all your life until you got saved. All of a sudden, something started changing, and you started seeking after God. You realized, wait a second, my real self is not pro-choice. It's pro-life. Amen? I'm really not afraid. I don't have the bond of the spirit of fear anymore. I'm full of the spirit of adoption. You find out who you really are by, by going and finding Jesus and finding yourself in him. It's concealed. It's hidden. Yes, you don't see it all right now. But if you'll pursue him, you will find him, and you will find out who you really are. The person that you have become after all of these years of doing what you wanted to do is not who you are. It's a shell of who you are. Who the real you is ridiculously fabulous. Hmm. 
our real self is concealed. But when by faith and obedience we allow Zoe to come in us and out of us, that very manifestation is the glory of God. So the glory of God is a manifestation of the presence of God. So when you find yourself hidden in Christ and you exhibit by obedience and faith the very thing he's telling you to do, light comes out of you, like it came out of his mouth, like he made, he made everything that there ever was, ever, that same creative force comes out of you. It is the glory of God. It's the, you hooked yourself up to the electrical outlet and light came out of you the same way it's in him. Every single time you find who you are by faith and obedience in Christ. That's a powerful word. It's a powerful word. Verse 10 says, you have clothed yourself with the new spiritual self, which is ever in the process of being renewed and remolded into fuller and more perfect knowledge upon knowledge after the image and the likeness of the one who created it. Now, the King James Version says that you put, on the, uh, you put off the old man, you put on the new man. And one of the things that I looked at when I was looking at the word, when it says off, it means to lie, to lie prostrate. And I thought about it. You know, if you have a, if you have a garment on, It's there. It doesn't hang in midair. It falls like a dead thing to the ground because that self has no life, right? It's dead. So we have to put off that old nature, and that thing lays prostrate. Think about that. It is, it, how, what's our, we're supposed to do what? Fall on our faces before the Lord. What is that? That's because we're saying, I'm a dead man. I don't have any will of my own anymore. I'm like that coat. I don't have life in me if it's not you. I don't resist you. I don't get up and walk away. I don't say anything because I put that thing off of me. And then he says you have to put on the new man. You got to clothe yourself now with the spirit of God. Now here's, can I just tell you something really pet, this is a pet peeve of mine, ready? Sorry. Love me through this. If you do this, you're going to be offended at me. But I love you. The issue is what we've done with putting off and putting on. We've done the same thing with putting off the old man and putting on the new man that we've done with putting on the armor of God. It infuriates me. We just say, I'm putting on my belt of truth, and I'm putting on my shoes. I'm, we're, I'm like, we're like, I'm putting on my helmet of salvation. We go through a little ritual of saying words about what we're putting on. That's not what Paul is talking about at all. You can get up every day and read the armor of God in the, in the book of Ephesians and say, Lord, right now I'm putting on my helmet of salvation. I'm putting on my breastplate of righteousness. I'm putting on my belt of truth. You know what? You have not put one thing on. It peeves me to no end. You don't leave here and go, I'm putting off the old man, putting on the new. No, you're not. You're saying words. We'll know if you put off the old man and put on the new man when I cut you off in traffic, hallelujah, we're going to find out what man's driving the car. Hallelujah. Amen. When Sister Susie opens her mouth, we're going to know which man's alive. Amen. Hallelujah. It's not about... <laughs> <laughs> y'all, some of y'all have said it to me. It's not about the words. We can't just say, I'm putting off the old, putting on the new. When, when blind Bartimaeus took off his garment, he left it there forever. He never picked it back up again, and he received a sight. He was like, I'm not mantling myself. That's my old identity. I don't even want it anymore. I'm going after the new thing. So we have to put on Christ. And, and because we see the language here in the Amplified, it, it amplifies, it says that this is a process this is a, a this is a remolding part of our nature in this in this birth that's taking place inside of us. That means every day putting on the the new man means I'm going to put on love when I feel like stabbing somebody in the throat. Instead of the spirit of murder, I'm taking on the spirit of love. Amen. Hallelujah. Y'all looking at me like you don't ever feel that. I know y'all are holy. I forgot. However, there's people I want to crush their heads. When God's telling me, okay, Annette, you have to not 
not eat that, and then all of a sudden I'm presented with the opportunity. I have to put on Christ, and by putting on Christ doesn't mean that while I eat the thing he told me not to eat, I say, I'm putting on my new man. No, it means I don't eat that, and by not eating that, I'm putting on the new man. See, it's not words. It's not lip service. It's you doing the very thing he's speaking to you to do. When you want, you want to be ugly to somebody, you're kind. And you're patient. And it's foreign to you. So what is it? Faith. And here's the whole thing. You may feel like you're being fake in your heart. Because you're practicing. Because kindness is not something you're used to wearing yet. It doesn't fit you just right. Sometimes it's really too tight. God's got stuff in a size 2 and you're a size 20. Hallelujah. It don't fit. Men. That's mean he's a size 32 and you're a size 40. It don't fit. You're a size 34 length and it's a 32 length. And you're like, hello, it's too tight and it's too short. This doesn't fit me. And we think because it doesn't fit, it can't be God. But it is God because he is taking who you are and making you fit into that very garment that he's putting on you. You can. The real you is hidden in Christ and it fits everything. His whole wardrobe fits you. Hallelujah. So clothe yourself with Jesus. We have a living hope that we've received. And because of living hope, we can look at our shortcomings in right perspective. We don't justify sin. We don't justify a lack of holiness. But we do look at it in the context of truth and understand that I am in process. And even though I don't fit this garment right now, there's a Holy Spirit who's a tailor who is making this fit me perfectly. Now, in verse 12, he says, Clothe yourself, therefore, as God's own chosen ones, his own hand-picked representatives who are purified and holy and well-beloved by God himself by putting on behavior marked by it. See, it's behavior marked by it. We're not putting on stuff by just saying, I'm putting it on. We're putting it on by exhibiting and putting on the very behavior of the one that we're following after. God's not going to dress you. God's not going to dress you. You are not a baby. He is not going to change you. You need to understand, and and that means me too, that we have to make a decision repeatedly to go to the closet, put on the new man by the actions that we take, and not allow that garment to come back on us again. So the wardrobe that he has for us fits us. We have to dress ourselves. It's not his job to do it. It's ours We have to see ourselves the way that the Lord sees us. And Paul tells us here that one, we're chosen by God, we're handpicked, we're purified, we're holy, and we're well-beloved. Now, look at some of the clothes you got to put on. Now, you know, look, I could have gone through all the other evil lurking member clothes that you had in your closet that he talks about, but we're not going to read all those because we are not that person. We have to look at who we are and what we can wear, right, in reality, so, first of all, here's some clothes. Ready? Some of y'all are going to like this. Tender-hearted pity and mercy. That's a garment that we're like, Bleh. only when we want pity and mercy. <laughs> Not anybody else. Kind feeling. A lowly opinion of yourselves. Humility and meekness is a garment that, that God wants us to wear. Gentle ways. And patience, which is tireless and long-suffering, has the power to endure whatever comes with good temper. Good temper, that's a bad word to me right there. Be gentle and forbearing with one another. And if one has a difference, a complaint against another, readily pardoning each other. Forgiveness is a garment that we wear as a new man. Even as the Lord has so freely forgiven you, so you must also forgive. How can you keep it ought against somebody else when Jesus has forgiven you and I for so much? What has any man done to you in this earth that's worth harboring it in your heart when God has delivered you and forgiven you from so much? Verse 14 says, above all else. So look, he's like, those are like undergarments. Now put on this on top of everything else. And fold yourself with love. Put on love and fold yourself with a bond of perfectness, which binds together everything completely in ideal harmony. You're like, that outfit doesn't go together. (laughs) 
It matches, I promise. Shoes, everything, it matches. Verse 15, let peace, soul harmony, which comes from Christ, rule and as a, act in, as an umpire continually in your hearts, deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your minds. In that peaceful state in which the members of Christ, one body, you were also called to live. Be thankful. Thankfulness is a garment. Giving praise to God always. Let the word spoken by Christ have its home in your hearts and minds and dwell in you in all of its richness. And as, as you teach and admonish and train one another in all insight and intelligence and wisdom and spiritual things, and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, make a melody to God with his grace in your hearts. And whatever you do, no matter what it is, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus and in dependence upon him, his person, giving praise to God the Father. Can I just say that you know that when you put on those garments, when you're thankful, when you're forgiving, when you're kind, you give mercy to people that you don't even think deserve any mercy, and you love them even though they may seem unlovable to you, do you know that you're actually teaching people how to live in Christ? When he's saying to teach them, admonish them, he's not saying all of you need a pulpit. He's saying all of you need to wear what God has given us. And by wearing what God has given us, we admonish and we teach the world what it's like to have our lives hidden in Christ. We show the world what the Father looks like because when nobody else will give them mercy, we will give them mercy. When nobody else will forgive them for their sins, we'll forgive them and we'll turn the other cheek. What? That's how we teach the world that Jesus is alive. I want to read this to you from the message and I'm all done. He says, so if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorb the things that are right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what's going on around Christ. That's where all the action is. See things from his perspective. Your old life is dead. Your new life, which is your real life, even though invisible to spectators, is with Christ in God. He is your life. When Christ's real life, remember he shows up again on the earth, you'll show up to the real you, the glorious you. Meanwhile, be content with obscurity like Christ. And that means killing off everything connected with the old, that way of death. Sexual promiscuity, impurity, lust, doing whatever you feel like whenever you feel like it. And grabbing whatever attracts your fancy. That's a life shaped by the things and feelings instead of by God. It's because of this kind of thing that God's about to explode in anger. It wasn't long ago that you were doing all that stuff and not knowing any better. But you know better now, so make sure it's all gone for good. Bad temper, irritability, meanness, profanity, dirty talk, don't lie to one another. You're done with that old life. It's like a, it's like a, 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 it's like a filthy set of ill-fitting clothes you've stripped off and you've put in the fire. Imagine that. All those ways that you used to be. It's like going to ashes and trying to wear ashes again. It didn't work not who you really are. Now you're dressed with a new wardrobe. Every item on your new way of life is custom made by the creator with his label on it. Ha, I love that. <laughs> Jehovah. <laughs> Jehovah jeans. I like that. Okay. All the old fashions are now obsolete. Words like Jewish and non-Jewish, religious and irreligious, insider and outsider, uncivilized and uncouth, slave and free, they mean nothing. From now on, everyone's defined by Christ. Everyone is included in Christ. So, you, chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe that God picked out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength and discipline. Be even-tempered, content with second place. What? That's so foreign to me right there. We play to win. Amen. <laughs> Content with second place. Quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic all-purpose garment. Never be without it. 
Let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with each other and step with each other. Wow. None of this going off and doing your own thing. Let's just read that again. Let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with each other. Hear that, body of Christ. Let the peace of Christ keep us in tune with each other and in step with each other. None of us going off and doing our own thing, and we're going to cultivate thankfulness. Let the word of Christ, the message, have the run of the house. Give it plenty of room in your lives. Instruct and direct one another using good common sense and seeing, seeing your hearts out to God. Let every detail in your lives, words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of the Master Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. You know what I really believe? I believe that's holy living. I believe that's holy living. It's not all about what you think you're doing right and wrong. It's what are you wearing. And I assure you, if you keep trying to go to that wardrobe closet that God has for you, and you practice wearing it, it's going to fit. And the things that you're struggling with and don't want to do anymore, those things will start falling off of you because you're doing and you're being and you're acting in faith and obedience. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we live a life that's just hot pursuit after you. Father, we just pray that you would give us clean hands and a pure heart, that we would not lift ourselves up to anything evil, and that we would be able to, to, to begin to ascend the mount of the Lord and begin to see the King of glory in the fullness of who he is. Lord, we want to be a people who are holy and set apart for you. We want to dress the way you want us to dress, and we want to turn this city upside down. We want this body to be turned upside down first. Father, we love you. We give you honor and glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going to be over there. I'm going to get the computer, and I'll be over there. Pastor Ness is going to be over in the coffee bar. In the coffee bar. Children's ministry, folks, come sit right over here. Also, those that uh, didn't check in in the beginning, if you could come over here also, we'll do it real quick. Um, five minutes, that's all I need. So uh, thank you. Be blessed. Bring a friend. Bring somebody to church Sunday, okay? We're going to believe God for a mighty move. Amen? Yeah, go, uh, get your kids. Matter of fact, go tell the teachers to come on out here. Get your kids. Let them loose. Uh, let the kids out of there. Come on over. Let's go. It's 10 till. I promise I'll have you out by 9. Don't turn me off. Did you turn me down? Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Hurry, 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 hurry. Hurry, hurry.